And now, Mr. Epstein, uh, we'll go to you for your opening statement. Thank you very much for having me. Um, in 2016, I testified in front of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee about how the anti-fossil fuel policies of the Obama-Biden administration would lead to higher energy prices, which would drive higher prices in every area of the global economy, which is exactly what's happened. As an energy expert and a philosopher, an expert on thinking methods, I explained to the senators that the basic mistake of the Obama administration was the failure to, quote, integrate the big picture data, unquote. The Obama administration was ignoring the unique benefits of fossil fuels to the global economy and to global human flourishing. Unfortunately, many of the senators were unwilling to recognize the error in themselves and in the administration. When I tried to get my senator from California, Barbara Boxer, to see that she was ignoring the unique benefits of fossil fuels, she dismissed me with the comment, I am not asking you anything. I am telling you that all you have to know is you are a philosopher and I don't appreciate getting lectured by a philosopher, unquote. But had Senator Boxer and the Obama-Biden administration listened to me and others who warned that anti-fossil fuel policies would lead to higher energy costs, which would lead to price inflation throughout the global economy, we wouldn't be experiencing a national and global energy crisis today. Let me be clear, today's energy crisis is very simple and it was completely preventable. The price of energy, like all prices, is set by supply and demand. For the last 15 years, the global anti-fossil fuel movement with major, with major leadership by Barack Obama and Joe Biden has acted aggressively to restrict the supply of fossil fuel energy, which has prevented it from keeping up with growing demand for fossil fuel energy. When fossil fuel supply goes down and fossil fuel demand goes up, fossil fuel energy prices go up. And when energy prices go up, the price of everything goes up. It's really that simple. Consider oil and gasoline prices. There's no physical reason the oil industry can't meet rising demand. The world has hundreds of years worth of oil deposits. There's no technical reason the oil industry can't meet rising demand. It's more capable than ever thanks to amazing technologies like fracking. If there's no physical or technical reason the oil industry can't meet rising demand, what is inhibiting it? Decades of rising restrictions on oil production and transport from anti-oil politicians, including Biden's massive threats to punish oil production going forward. Perhaps the greatest limiter of the supply of oil has been anti-oil politicians' constant threats to severely restrict or even ban oil production going forward. For example, when Joe Biden promises, I guarantee you we're going to end fossil fuel, and then becomes president, many oil investors run for the hills. Is it any wonder that threatened with punishment, investment in oil and gas has declined dramatically? Between 2011 and 2021, oil and gas exploration investments declined by 50%. Less investment equals less supply equals higher prices. The basic solution to oil and gasoline prices is simple. We need a long-term congressional commitment to liberate domestic oil production. This also applies to the rest of fossil fuel production. Until Congress makes clear that the government will stop threatening and destroying oil production, companies will rightly underinvest in production. More broadly, the basic global solution to the energy crisis is for the global community to reject the anti-fossil fuel movement and reverse all global anti-fossil fuel policies. This includes canceling the Paris Agreement, the policy that is driving the world to rapidly restrict the supply of desperately needed fossil fuels. Don't be afraid that liberating fossil fuels will doom the world to climate catastrophe. As I document in chapters seven through nine of my book, Fossil Future, Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas, Not Less, fossil fuel CO2 emissions have contributed to the warming of the last 170 years, but that warming has been mild and easily masterable one degree Celsius, mostly in the colder parts of the world. And life on Earth thrived when CO2 levels were more than five times today's. Fossil fuels have actually made us far safer from climate by providing low-cost energy for the amazing machines that protect us against storms, protect us against extreme temperatures, and alleviate drought. That's why the rate of climate-related disaster deaths, deaths from extreme temperatures, droughts, wildfires, storms, and floods, has decreased by 98% over the last century. What we've been told about fossil fuels is exactly backward. We are told that we should be afraid of continuing fossil fuel use because it will make the world unlivable. 
In fact, fossil fuel use has made the world a better and better place to live, including safer from climate for the last two centuries and can continue to do so going forward. What will make the world unlivable for more and more people, as we are seeing now tragically, is the attempt to eliminate fossil fuels, which necessarily leads to energy crises and economic crises. The only way out of this crisis is for America and the world to embrace a fossil future. Thank you. Let me ask, uh, and I still want to say Governor Secretary, Governor Secretary, you know, uh, when you were governor, uh, I'd seen somewhere that we increased the amount of natural gas usage uh, about every year, as I recall, and yet the air quality continued to improve every single year. Uh, in, isn't that accurate? I could. Could I give a little of my Please. time right now yeah. to Alex and, and ask Alex to talk about cost effective uh, fossil fuels and why the wealth that they create allow for the technologies that allow for the emission reductions? Alex, would you touch on that, please? Uh, sure. If, if uh, Representative Gomer is OK. Sure, that, please. I'm happy to have talk about that. OK, so. I think I use the term cost effective, and I think it's really important. There are four dimensions of cost effective, and right now fossil fuels are the only energy technology that meet them. So to be cost effective is to be affordable, reliable, versatile, and scalable. The first two are probably clear, but the, the, the third is really important. Versatile means every type of machine, including things like cargo ships and airplanes and really high heat machines that we use for industry that we don't think too much about, that we don't use electricity for these things today because it's not the cost effective way. And then scalable is really important for billions of people in thousands of places. And so we've got a world where the vast majority of people still lack cost effective energy. We have 3 billion people using less electricity than one of our refrigerators uses. We have a third of the world using wood and animal dung. So you've got a situation where you've got one uniquely cost-effective form of energy, namely fossil fuels, that provide 80% of the world's energy and are still growing in a world that desperately needs more energy. So point number one is that reducing CO2 emissions should absolutely not be your highest priority. Empowering the world should be your highest priority. And as I mentioned, the more you empower the world, the safer you become from climate, even as your emissions increase, because your ability to master the climate is so high. But also the only way that emissions will get reduced long term is with truly cost effective alternatives. And this is part of the reason I'm so big on liberating natural gas, but above all, liber liberating nuclear which, which uh, Governor Perry mentioned. Again, is China, think about it, is China going to use uh, solar and wind? No, they're using coal to produce solar and wind. Is India? No, everyone is rightly going to use the most cost-effective form of energy. So if your concern is emissions, priority number one, two, and three has to be liberating the promising low emission alternatives. That's the actual way to get emissions down long-term if that's what you care about. But unfortunately, the left tends to be anti-fossil fuel, anti-nuclear and anti-hydro, also anti-mining, which solar and wind require record amounts of mining. And the root of that, as I explain in Fossil Future, is the goal of that movement is not to advance human flourishing on Earth, it's to eliminate human impact on Earth. And so they have a hostility toward all energy because it involves impact. And so I think that the concern with climate is a sham. Epstein, um, the Biden regime has claimed that there's nothing Joe Biden could have done to prevent today's gasoline prices. You've written that Joe Biden, uh, had Joe Biden not spent the last year and a half opposing oil and instead spent his time liberating U.S. oil production and encouraging the rest of the world to do the same, gasoline prices would be far, far loader, lower. Can you explain why, please? Sure, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, the, the argument that seems plausible is, oh, it's a global market so we can't control it. So the obvious lie there is you can control the US energy market, which is a huge market, but also you are the leader of the free world. Imagine Joe Biden had come into office in 2021 and said, hey, there's this dangerous anti-fossil fuel movement. As soon as we recover from this pandemic lockdown, there's gonna be way more demand than supply. We need to reject the Paris Agreement. We need to stay out of it. And we need to tell others to get out of it. If you had opposed the global anti-fossil fuel movement, and encouraged energy freedom around the world, you would have had a proliferation 
of oil production, natural gas production, coal production, and you wouldn't have these problems at all. We'd be going through a global energy renaissance, not a global energy crisis. So Biden instead has been leading the world away from fossil fuels. He's been very aggressively pressuring nations to go away from fossil fuels. So he did the exact wrong thing, and he turned the opportunity for an energy renaissance into a global energy crisis. Uh, thank you. And Mr. Epstein, uh, a follow-up. In May, Joe Biden canceled three sales amounting to millions of acres that would have been available for drilling. He hasn't even issued a single new lease sale to date. And we're still waiting on the new national program for the 2022 through 2027 period. A few weeks ago, the American Energy Alliance published a comprehensive list of 100 ways the Biden regime has made it more difficult to produce oil and gas. 32 of those occurred after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Do you think that the Biden regime's repeated attempts at deflection are convincing the American people? Time has expired, um, but I'll let you answer. I hope, I, I hope not. But it's, it's, I think the key is to make it really simple and say prices are set by supply and demand. The Biden administration restricted supply and encouraged the rest of the world to do the same. And that made prices go up by restricting supply while demand increases. And don't, don't allow the people who caused this crisis to overcomplicate it or to distort it. Thank you very much, Mr. Epstein. How can we reverse course uh, how, what kind of irreparable harm has been done to energy producers and uh, industries like auto manufacturing with this stop and go? We had the relief on the Trump administration. Now we've got the, the shackles again by this administration. The fear that would come with a new administration, hey, what's the long-term projection? Alex, you said that we need a congressional commitment to liberate domestic production. So Ms. Sagama, Mr. Epstein, with uh, just a, a couple of moments left, but wh what would you say about what we can do to have a long-term commitment uh, to this from a congressional standpoint? Well, the first thing is to talk in those terms. So if you get power, it's how do you pass laws? And, and I think of this as we need an energy freedom platform. And I know I've talked to you about some of this, and I think five key planks are end preferences for unreliable electricity, decriminalize nuclear energy, liberate responsible development of American energy, practice pro-human federal lands management, and reduce emissions through liberating innovation, not punishing America. But it's really about making this a matter of law so that companies have that legal certainty. Right now, even if you get a better president in Congress, if you don't make things a matter of law, they're just gonna fear the next election. And that is no, op that is no environment for any business to operate under, let alone the long-term energy industry. Let me ask you this. Um, how do we get leaders to speak out? Well, maybe I'll comment for a second, but I want to hear what uh, our former energy secretary has to say uh, about the issue. So I think we have a real once in a lifetime opportunity right now because the possibility of a global energy crisis, like the possibility of massive inflation, has not been on people's minds since the early 1980s, and people got away scot-free with these anti-fossil fuel, anti-energy policies, and now we're seeing them come to fruition. So it is very important to blame the people responsible for those of us who have been in the right to claim vindication and then to put forward our own positive narrative. So it has to be pro-energy freedom, and that includes being pro-fossil fuels. And one key aspect is to tell everyone, hey, we need to look at the full context with fossil fuels. We need to look at the benefits and the side effects, not just look at the negative side effects. And when you give that message, people can see the amazing benefits of fossil fuels, not just for Americans, but for billions of people around the world. And I found that very effective uh, myself. But I'd love to hear what Secretary Perry yes. has to say. Um, Alex, I'll be brief. You're spot on. Um, all three of these uh, individuals who have testified here in front of you today, uh, they understand the dynamic that's going on. And I think it's really important uh, to understand what Alex just said about we really haven't had any pain in this country uh, since uh, maybe back in, I mean, real pain by the energy side of things since maybe back in the 70s with, with the Carter administration. So uh, the the you know, kind of the wind at our back, the blue skies, the ain't it great to be an American, uh, and oh yeah, we're for uh, we're for the climate and we're woke and we're all of this kind of cool stuff right now. Uh, it's not so cool now. It's not so cool when you can't put gas in your car. It's not so cool when you uh, you can't take care of your family. And that's got to be the message that, particularly those of you who are running for office, because you're going to be you're going to be the dynamic of which uh, decides what the 
direction that America is going to go in the future. And, and you've got to have the courage. And when you've got people like Alex, his book, and when you've got uh, the industry that with the finding the courageous people in the industry that will stand up and say, hey, we ain't interested in being woke. We're interested in taking care of, uh, of the people in, in this country, or for that matter, the citizens of this world. And we have the moral argument on our side. We need to take it. We need to run with it. And uh, I think we can be successful with it. Well, we can't be timid. Tell me about the wisdom, all four of our panelists, real, real quickly, on what is – should should we embrace the president's uh, gas tax, diesel tax holiday when also at the same time we're running a massive federal deficit? Uh, uh, just one, one quick comment. The, the claim of this administration to want – lower gasoline prices is at best a gigantic pretense and most likely a lie. Their goal from the beginning is to make fossil fuels unaffordable so you don't use them. And so everything needs to be focused on blaming the current global anti-fossil fuel movement, including this administration, for the problem and demanding that they reverse course in a system in a system in a systematic way. And, and I think all the focus needs to be on that and do not allow them to blame industry and don't allow them to do these ridiculous, tiny measures that act like they care about the problem. They don't. They are the problem. Mr. Epstein, can you talk about the issue we have currently, not only with the lack of pipeline development throughout the United States, but what, you know, even in the big media, they're starting to talk about, about the real issue we have with a lack of oil refining capacity in the United States, and what do you think we need to be doing to rectify both of those situations? Just very quickly, I think we need to recognize that the assault on American energy includes opposition to fossil fuel investment, fossil fuel production, fossil fuel processing, including refining, and fossil fuel transportation, including pipelines. And what I said about a long-term commitment by Congress, that needs to apply to all four of those aspects. What we're seeing is the energy industry is an incredible industry that provides energy for billions of people, hundreds of millions of Americans, but it takes freedom. And when you restrict freedom randomly, you don't think through the consequences, then you have these supply shortages and you can't get rid of them by being upset because you're getting bad polls, which is the administration's basic response. They're upset, not because they're upset about the consequences, but they don't like the polls. So we really need people in office who care about energy and are willing to make long-term commitments to liberate it. Mr. Epstein, again, thank you for being here today as well. Thanks to all of you again. So um, we talked a little bit about nuclear um, as a um, truly important cog to our energy development if we're going to be truly self-sustaining again. So there is there are there is science out there that professes to take um, the 96% of the of the um, nuclear fuel that is used that is not used up in the process and turning that and reforming it reusing it recycling it repurposing it um, as as a as a new fuel uh, are you familiar with that that emerging technology yes but i don't think it's the central issue well it's it's, it's not the central issue because we we won't even approve any nuclear uh, reactor development, right? So that's the central issue. Yeah. Can I, can I say a word on nuclear? Yeah. Because um, I'm known as pro-fossil fuels, but really I'm pro-energy and pro-global human flourishing, and that requires more of every form of cost-effective energy, certainly fossil fuels and also nuclear. So one thing I'm working on, and I invite anyone here, anyone listening to this who's in Congress to participate, is I think we need a new energy freedom platform, and a key plank needs to be decriminalized nuclear. So let me just very quickly give you some of the steps for this. We need to banish what's called the linear no threshold hypothesis, which is total pseudoscience that treats any amount of radiation as deadly, which makes no sense. We need to streamline the nuclear licensing process. I think it should take a maximum of two years, not 16 years or whatever it often takes. We need to prohibit anti-development activists from participating in the permitting process where they have no place being. Um, we need to allow all cheap and safe forms of nuclear waste disposal, although current nuclear waste is quite safe. That's important. Uh, we need to eliminate all government discrimination against nuclear. We need to end all government preferences for unreliable electricity. And I think somebody, I think uh, Secretary slash Governor Perry said, and this is really important, the state should be able to take this over. So I think states should be able to opt out of the federal approval process 
and establish state approval processes. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is the Nuclear Criminalization Commission. Since its advent in 1975, it has not approved from conception to completion one single nuclear plant and makes nuclear prohibitively expensive. You can't nibble around the edges there either. That needs fundamental reform or abolition. And so we really need nuclear decriminalization. It's not enough to subsidize or to say it's okay. We need to totally decriminalize it. And if anyone is interested, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. I'm very passionate about making this change when we get a new Congress and maybe a new president at some point. Uh, alex, uh, re repeat your email again, please. Alex at alexepstein, E-P-S-T-E-I-N, dot com.